Welcome back to the second part of our book breakdown of Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success by Ken Seagal. For part one of uh, this book breakdown, listen to episode 173. This is episode 174. And again, as a quick reminder, if you want to find all of the notes, highlights, and takeaways from this book, you can find those at outlieracademy.com slash insanely simple. We've got a prolific amount of notes from the book, 35 pages when printed. I highly encourage you to go check it out. So in part two, we're going to jump in exactly where we left off. Uh, in part one, I set up the book and we went through a number of important chapters and, and principles. And again, the book is broken down into 10 principles all around how to apply this concept of simplicity uh, to the company and the products that you're building. And so we covered the principles, think brutal, think small, think minimal, think motion, and think iconic. In this second half of the episode, we're going to jump right back in at Think Phrasal, uh, which tells the story of uh, naming the original iMac, which is an incredible story, as well as coming up with the iNaming framework, which again, Apple's become synonymous for. It's a little i at the beginning of iPhone, iPod, iPad. Um, and we're going to talk about the origin story of that. And then I'm going to cover uh, the remaining chapters I think are really interesting. So we're going to talk about a couple of principles from Think Casual, Think Human, Think Skeptic, Think War think different. And finally, we're going to sum it all up by basically reviewing the 10 concepts with a little quick synopsis of each. So let's jump in to Think Phrasal. Um, this story was incredible. And it's incredible for a number of reasons. Uh, and this is the story of naming the original iMac. Part of why it's incredible is just how terrible a name Apple started out with. Um, and the initial name for, for iMac, you know, again, I'll give the full story in a second, was MacMan. And what's really interesting here, I'll just make a quick connection. Um, you know, Steve alludes to it, this, uh, Steve alludes to this in this meeting he's having with Ken Seagal and the, and the team at Shia Day, but Mac man came from Phil Schiller and, you know, a lot of, I think how to understand why Steve liked this name is, you know, Steve has a couple of heroes in his life. Um, one of them was the founder of Polaroid, you know, another was Henry Ford. Um, and another was Akito Morita, who was the co-founder of Sony. And, you know, Sony came out with the Walkman, which was obviously a source of some inspiration. Steve alludes to that in a second. Um, but I think it's just interesting. It's interesting because I think a lot of, you know, a lot of the, Steve, a lot of the ideas that Steve uh, became famous for pushing forward. One was that Apple was building at the intersection of technology and, uh, and, and kind of humanity, you know, or, or technology and the arts. Um, that concept came from the founder of Polaroid and, and Steve Jobs basically recognized it, adopted it and pushed it forward and applied it at Apple. Um, and the reason I call that out is, you know, I think something that gets missed about Steve is uh, I think a lot of people have a view that Steve was just this amazing genius and he was, but Steve also spent an enormous amount of time learning from the best entrepreneurs that came before him and taking on a lot of their ideas. And so I think it's just interesting, interesting kind of context, interesting bit of color to come into the story with. So this is the story, the story of, of how they arrived at the name, the iMac. Um, just going to jump right into the text. Incredibly enough, it all started by trying to beat the name Steve originally gave the iMac, MacMan. We already have a name we like a lot, but I wanted to see if you guys can beat it, said Steve. The name is MacMan. While that frightening name is banging around in your head, I'd like you to think for a moment about the art of product naming. Because of all of the things in this world that cry out for simplicity, product naming probably contains the most glaring examples of right and wrong. Phil Schiller, Apple's worldwide marketing manager, was in the room, and Steve revealed that MacMan was Phil's contribution. I think it's sort of reminiscent of Sony, said Steve, referring, of course, to Sony's legendary Walkman line of personal music players. But I have to tell you, I don't mind a little rub-off from Sony. They're a famous consumer company, and if MacMan seems like a Sony kind of consumer product, that might be a good thing. Um, before we left the premises, Steve threw out some guidelines for our naming development. First of all, you have to know it's Mac. So I think it has to have the word Mac in it. This was priority number one, because looks aside, it was a Mac through and through, running all the same software. Steve had two warnings for us, though, two traps he didn't want us to fall into. Number one, this is a full-powered Mac, but some people are going to look at it and think it's a toy. And, he, and again, this initial iMac was the beautifully candy-colored um, iMac with a handle on top. Um, and so people were thinking it's going to think it's a toy because it looked like no computer that had ever been made or sold before. Back to, back to Steve's quote. So the name shouldn't sound too frivolous. There's also a danger people might think it's portable because it's got a big handle on top. But this thing is heavy. The handle is just there to make it easier to move around in the house. So don't make it sound portable. 
two really interesting pitfalls. Um, we'd gone through a list of candidates, trimmed it down to five favorites, and created a single poster board for each. Each board presented a name in big, juicy type, along with a short list of bullets that described its virtues. Our favorite name was one that I'd come up with early in the process, iMac. It seemed to solve all the problems at once. It was clearly a Mac. The I conveyed that this Mac was a Mac, uh, was designed to get onto the internet, which is fascinating. Just an aside for a second, I think it's incredible that, uh, you know, I think we give Apple a lot of credit for I, and, you know, I could stand for innovation and all these things, but I literally just stood for it could access the internet, which was relevant then is no longer relevant. And yet the I naming framework still works so well. Um, back in, back into the text. It was also a perfectly succinct name, just a single letter um, to the word Mac. It didn't sound like a toy and it didn't sound portable. We'd gone through a long list of candidates, trimmed it down to five favorites, um, and were ready to review it with Steve. Um, using the word Mac in the product name was more of a revolution than you might realize. At that time, Macintosh had yet to be shortened to the colloquial Mac in the name of any Apple computer. For simplicity and minimalism, iMac seemed to be perfect. And of course, there was also one other small advantage that came with the name iMac. It created an interesting foundation upon which Apple could name future consumer products. Maybe, possibly, somehow, sometime, Apple could see a fit to create another i product. A week later, we generated another batch of names. We threw out all the previous names but left iMac in the mix, despite the fact that Steve had used the hate word. In this presentation, and I love this, I relied on a philosophy I learned a long time ago from a wise man in advertising. It was, as long as you've got new ideas to share, you are free to represent the old ones. Now they're back in, in Cupertino for presentation number two. I walked Steve uh, through the new names first. After I'd gone through the new list, he still didn't like any. Then that's when I pulled out iMac again and told him we still had a, uh, had a lot of heart for that one. Steve gave it the courtesy of a fresh look. Well, I don't hate it this week, he said but I still don't love it. Now we've only got a couple of days left and I still think Mac Man is the best name we have. I'd like to say that there, and I think this is a really interesting part in the story um, because this is not how you would expect this to end. I'd like to say that there was some big uh, turnaround after this point. One moment of glory that had us all high-fiving one another, but there was not. The very next day while talking to one of, uh, one of my Apple clients, I learned that there was action on the naming front. Steve was making the rounds asking people what they thought of iMac. He'd had the name silk screened onto a model to see how it looked. I never heard another peep about this decision. Steve basically took it and ran. Obviously, he liked what he saw when he got the model back, and he must have received positive reactions from his inner circle, and so iMac it was. This, of course, says an interesting thing about the way Steve Jobs worked. He had an opinion, a very strong opinion, the kind of opinion that might knock you over and kick you a few times, but that's not to say he wasn't reasonable and wouldn't ultimately change his mind if confronted with heartfelt opinions presented with passion. This was a key moment for Apple. When its love of simplicity won the day and set it on a course it follows to this very day, Steve was unrelenting in his desire to give this great product a great name. He appreciated the power of words. In this case, he appreciated the power of a single letter. And that letter I became one of the most important parts of the Apple brand. So it's a really interesting story. And I mean, a couple of things that strike me, number one, you know, Steve going around and making the rounds to ask other people's opinions. This is very common among some of the best leaders. You know, I think Satya Nadella at Microsoft gets a lot of praise for this today, where a lot of teammates will, will uh, basically share a similar story that he'll, you know, come to them out of the blue, ask to spend 45 minutes or an hour with them and just ask them their opinions about the company. Um, totally separately, you know, I read a random story. Um, it was actually a quote. It was a, a beautiful quote from, uh, this was at UPS. It was a UPS driver who was, uh, whose, whose car broke down on the side of the road. He needed to replace one of the tires. And, um, uh, the UPS founder actually came, uh, noticed him on the side of the road, pulled over. Obviously the employee recognized him and was a little bit awestruck. And the founder helped him fix his tire and then said, Hey, do you mind if we, if I just grab 45 minutes of your time, I just want to ask you a few questions. And literally, you know, I think the commonality in these conversations, what's so impressive is it's not about the founder or the CEO sitting down and sharing ideas. It's, it's literally just asking questions and listening. And I think, uh, you know, for the world's best leaders, um, you know, that's a skill set that they rely on very often. You know, they're not trying to guide people. They're not trying to impress upon something on people. They see it as a core part of their job to just constantly go out, ask great questions and listen to what their team has to say. 
Um, and so I think it's just interesting in that Steve did that here. And, you know, it, like, obviously there's some mystery in uh, how he ended up getting conviction. But, you know, I love the approach of like, one, let's see what it looks like on the product. And let's also go and have a bunch of, of conversations and see if other people disagree with me. And if enough do, enough that I respect, I'm willing to change my opinion. Um, so just a couple of ways that this like gets applied. I think uh, a couple of interesting naming examples from Apple in, in, you know, in ways that I think we can all apply. Beyond common sense, Apple's approach to naming embraces the concept of consistency. Its computers are all Macs all the, uh, all the time. iMac, Mac Pro, MacBook Pro, MacBook Air. The I identifies Apple's consumer devices and is always attached to a word that's descriptive of the product or product category. You know, this is really interesting with iPhone um, in, in just recognizing that in many ways, it's, you know, it's, it's a very Apple name. It's a very ownable name in that it's iPhone. Uh, but the majority of, of the name is just phone, which in many ways is um, a huge letdown. But the reason it works, and this is what I appreciated here, is, you know, many times simplicity shows up as common sense. And, you know, this is why uh, common sense is often something you should listen to. And here, you know, yes, you could get more clever than iPhone, but what are you really trying to communicate? You're trying to communicate this is an Apple product. Well, great. You put the I in front of it and it does that. And you're trying to communicate that the, what category consumer should should fit this product into and, and in many ways what category you're trying to disrupt and so i just love this idea you know ipod is different obviously or sorry ipad is different a pad is not you know a, a category that people are familiar with but i think iphone is a really interesting example uh, again you know so the idea here the i identifies apple consumer devices and is always attached to a word that's descriptive of the product or product category it's an interesting observation the naming structure across Apple's major product lines is easy for current and potential customers to understand. And every time you say the name of an Apple product, you know it's an Apple product. That's an incredibly powerful concept, as simple as simple gets, but few companies manage to achieve that kind of branding power in their product names. Another example from iPhone. New models of iPhone have come out annually since 2007, but each and every one carries the same name. Modifiers exi exist to distinguish between models. So, you know, a modifier would be 3GS, an iPhone 4, 4S, etc. But such references are used only when conversationally necessary. And I think this is really interesting. If you go and look at Apple's site, you know, they will call the model of the phone at the, at the, at the top of the page. So say you go, you're looking at iPhone 15. You're going to go see iPhone 15 page and, and it'll be used there. But after the, you know, it's only useful, uh, they only use it where it's relevant. So they'll use iPhone 15 when it's part of the purchase experience. They'll use iPhone 15 when it's part of the tech specs. They use iPhone 15 just to anchor and set up the page and the product. But if you look through the rest of the copy, it just is always iPhone. Um, and again, you know, people will say, I'll look it up on my iPhone, but rarely I'll look it up on my iPhone 4. And so just this idea of like, Apple does have modifiers, but the reason it has modifiers is for identification purposes. Um, and then it drops it in, in most storytelling that they do and just uses the word iPhone. And I think it's just an interesting, it's an interesting heuristic. You can think about how you might be able to apply that. Then it gives one more example here about the iPod. With several distinctive shapes, iPod has its own naming story. Obviously, iPod's a little less relevant now than it was when this book was published, um, but it's still an interesting example, I think. Unlike the different models of iPhone, which all have a similar use, the different models of iPod have very different uses. There's iPod Touch for an iPhone-like experience with email and apps, iPod Nano for full-featured portability, and iPod Shuffle, featherweight, screenless, and ideal for working out. But even with distinct names for different models, iPod naming is based in common sense, with monikers that are descriptive of each model size or purpose. And all of this is relevant for Mac. When you think about MacBook Pro versus MacBook Air, really simple labels, but they communicate broadly what is, what is different. Um, okay, back to, the, to this iPod example. There are no arcane number and letter schemes. There are simply touch, nano, and shuffle. These names themselves have become part of the customer's vocabulary, single words that are easily remembered. Apple doesn't uh, just keep naming simple for the sake of brand building. It keeps naming simple so it doesn't confuse the hell out of people. Apple is unrelenting about sending the message of simplicity to its customers. It does that with every product it creates and every word it chooses. So super interesting. It's a super interesting chapter. I mean, I appreciate, I've had to go through this exercise now with tens of companies of helping them think through how to name their product. Or, you know, when I was a part of Square, uh, we had to go in and we had, uh, you know, we Square started out obviously building a, uh, a reader and sort of like a, uh, 
a piece of software that merchants would use to check our customers. But over time, we so suddenly needed to differentiate between the different types of software that we had and the different types of products that we had. And so anyways, naming is something I have a lot of fondness and fascination for. Um, I think that Apple's approach and some of the principles that they pulled out are really powerful. Um, and again, you know, it, like a question I've often asked myself um, is, you know, it, like what Apple has done by co-opting I as a single letter and being able to stick that in front of things and being able to actually have that work and be recognizable. I find it hard to believe that another company will pull that off, but I would love to see it. And, you know, I'm interested to see if there ever comes a day when another company is able to pull off the single letter as a brand identifier um, in the way that Apple has. Okay, we're going to breeze through a couple of chapters here. Um, these are chapters I didn't, you know, per, I didn't love the majority of what was in them, but there are some ideas that are just too good not to share. And again, why do I do this? I want to go through these books break them down so that I retain for myself the best ideas from them. And so I can share with all of you, you know, the like 50%, 30% of the book that really truly matters. Um, and the way that I think about that, honestly, is like, what ideas do I want to continually surface and come back to again and again and again? And those are the things I want to pull from the book. One of the chapters I didn't love is Think Casual, but there's two ideas from it that really resonated with me. Simplicity is in a hurry. It wants to cut to the chase and concentrate on the important stuff. No insult to you and all the time you've spent preparing that convincing speech, but much of what you're about to say is likely superfluous. And many people incorrectly assume that by increasing the word count, they will demonstrate their smarts, when the opposite is almost always closer to reality. Those who know how to communicate with brevity are the ones who come across as smarter and are more appreciated by executives who value their time. I would also say, you know, if you go and look at Apple's communication style, simplicity is definitely a hallmark. Um, and what I mean by that is, um, you know, Apple does not have, they, uh, th there's very few Apple pages you can go to and, and it's like so sparse, you don't know what's going on. So Apple always is manages to achieve this like perfect copy length. Uh, and it uses these very, uh, you know, kind of like advertising age old standards where a lot of how it communicates is a simple headline and occasionally a subhead. And they'll do this really interesting thing where the headline and subhead are meant to be paired and they play off of one another. Um, and occasionally an expansive, you know, paragraph might go underneath it. And by paragraph, I mean, probably two or three sentences. And, you know, what's interesting about brevity just really quickly is um, brevity is another example of it being harder. You know, being able to take a paragraph and pare it down to a single sentence actually requires a lot of time, energy and effort if you're trying to keep the essence of what's there. And I would say what's fascinating to me, having worked on Apple's team, having worked with Apple's copywriters is uh, it is an extreme challenge to try to be brief clear and compelling, meaning like, you know, I, what Apple tries to achieve. And actually there was, you know, a period in time where I think Apple leaned into this much more and they've, they've uh, moved away from this, but there was a period in time where like all of Apple's headlines were biting and witty and funny and, uh, you know, just like striking. And so to be able to have short copy that's striking is very, very, very hard. Um, and so think casual here is just this idea of like, communicate simply communicate clearly, communicate um, in a way that's as short and succinct as humanly possible. Um, another chapter is on thinking human. I thought this was interesting, just some interesting ideas here. The technology that drives Apple's devices is incredibly complex. One with technical expertise could write dissertations describing how these simple devices do what they do. But Apple never will. It prefers to speak in more human terms. Apple didn't describe the original iPod as a 6.5 ounce music player with a five gigabyte drive. It simply said 1,000 songs in your pocket. This is the way human beings communicate, so this is the way Apple communicates. Human speak is a hallmark of simplicity. It's the recognition that the best way to communicate with people is to put things in human terms and use the words that people use in everyday conversation. This human way of speaking became Apple's trademark at the very beginning, despite the fact that Apple's products were pure technology assemblages of circuit boards and buttons and enclosures. Apple made it clear that they were made for ordinary people who wanted to do extraordinary things. It took something that was inherently complicated and turned it into something that was wonderfully simple. Even during stages in its past when Apple rarely used imagery of human beings, it was widely regarded as the most human technology company on earth. Its humanity was achieved primarily through intelligent wit. Here, we must give credit to former Shiat creative director Steve Hayden, who led the charge on the original Macintosh. 
Students of advertising would do well to go back and read the ads Hayden wrote in the early days of Macintosh. He gave Apple a voice that was distinct, simple, and seemingly clear. And here, you know, I might, uh, I haven't put any of this in the uh, book breakdown. Again, you can find that at outlieracademy.com slash insanely simple, but I should. And so I, I, I did a bit of research here. You can go and find online. Um, and this is way back in like the, the uh, I want to say the 80s, maybe the late 70s. Um, and look at, uh, you know, some of these guides and advertising is a very different age of advertising, uh, then that Steve Hayden put together. Um, but it, but I would encourage you to just go and look at, um, I, I would encourage you to go and look back at, you know, like original or, or, uh, Apple's materials from the, from the late seventies and eighties, because what's compelling to me is there was just as much time, energy, and effort put into simplicity, put into talking directly to customers, put into describing their technology simply and, and describing it emotionally, as opposed to leaning into technical specifications. Like there's a clear through line. I think that's really impressive. Okay. Moving on so, uh, out of that rabbit hole. Apple isn't interested in ideas that try to please everyone. Those are ideas that end up stripped of their character, feeling calculated and worst of all, less human. Um, talk a little bit about, so there's a chapter again, just a few ideas that I liked from it called Think Skeptic. Um, and one of them was just around standing up for details. And this is a rabbit hole. If you're interested, you could go search much more. I'll give a little bit of commentary, but it's about the unboxing experience and why this is so important. People often talk about the unboxing experience that comes with buying an Apple product. YouTube has countless videos documenting step-by-step -step and piece-by-piece -piece the opening of an Apple product box. To the outsider, this is simply another example of Apple fanboyism. It's just a box, right? To Apple, a box is hardly a box. The company takes incredible care to ensure that the entire customer experience is consistently first quality. And that first moment when the customer is going through the packaging is a significant part of the experience. I'm going to pause here for a second and share a little bit of commentary. Um, you know, when I was on Apple's uh, creative team, there was literally an entire team dedicated to packaging. It was a packaging team. Um, and, you know, there are a couple of things that are really interesting. One, culturally, you know, some of you may appreciate this, some of you might not. Apple derives a lot of inspiration for packaging from, from uh, Japanese culture. Um, I, you know, have been lucky enough, I spent um, a handful of weeks in Japan. It's a place that I deeply love. One of the weird random books that I got there is an entire book on traditional Japanese packaging. And so this is things like going to a farmer's market and say buying five onions and the elaborate way that they would wrap these five onions uh, beautifully, simply, uh, you know, functionally, it's like it strikes everything. But a large part of Japanese culture is this like appreciation and craftsmanship and the tiniest of details. And that's something that Apple very clearly drew an enormous amount of inspiration from. Um, and the unboxing experience is different. You know, for Apple, they, uh, you know, and I think uh, maybe you need to draw a little bit of a corollary. I think for many companies, when they think about product experience, they think, you know, they tend to kind of like, um, <laughs> they don't think about it in real time as a customer experiences experiences it. And instead they think about it as like critical moments of like, you know, okay, I'm designing a to-do to -do list app. I, I It's going to be really important about how you get set up. I care a lot about onboarding. It's going to be really important about what it's like to set, you know, create your tasks. Um, you know, and then, and so people kind of like put a spotlight on a couple of things that they think is important for, for a customer experience and honestly, largely black out for the rest of the experience. It's not even on their radar. For Apple, very clearly, they think through everything and they want a through line through everything. They think through what it's going to be like when you hear about it for the first time, whether it's from a keynote or an ad. They think about what it's like when you go and you want to do a little bit more learning about it. And so the marketing experience is beautiful. They think about the shopping experience. The amount of time, energy, and detail put into whether it's online shopping or going into a store is absurd. They put an enormous amount of time into setting up your Mac or setting up your iPhone, whether you're porting from another iPhone or the Mac or not. It's an incredible, beautiful experience. It's got animation. It's got sound design. It's got all the things. And so, of course, they're going to put that much attention into packaging. But it's also very bizarre and very rare. And uh, if you're interested, I would just highly encourage you to go to uh, Google search um, like Apple packaging design or Apple packaging design engineering. Um, because one of the things that I loved uh, getting to work with that team a little bit is a lot of how they thought about packaging was through engineering, just meaning like, 
you know, what are most of our experiences with packaging? Packaging is shitty. It's made with the worst cardboard. It's either too difficult to open or it's too easy to open. The box comes dinged. You know, it's unclear what I unbox first or second. Like I feel like a, opening a TV is a great example of this. You basically pull out this wad of shit with the TV and all the cables in it, and then you have to untether it. And so, you know, Apple's products are uh, meticulously built. They're engineered to be sturdy and rigid and feel valuable. You know, they, they even, uh, I remember reading an article a, a while ago about how Apple obsesses over, you know, if you've ever, um, and I don't know if the, the latest iPhone boxes have these, but for a number of years, like a decade plus, you know, the iPhone packaging, if you unboxed it, you could set the other half on top of the other half and it was perfectly engineered. And then, you know, it, it had such great quality control that uh, you would be able to see the box slowly decompress as air slowly moved out of it and it would settle and basically collapse on its own. Like these are things that are very difficult to pull off that I, I think make a huge difference. And uh, I'll just make one more point, which is, you know, I've thought a lot about craftsmanship and, and Apple's a great company that I think uh, to me exemplifies craftsmanship. And the best definition I've been able to come up with for what craftsmanship is, is it's spending an absurd amount of time on, on, on what may seem like insignificant details or an absurd amount of time on the quality of the overall experience. And, uh, you know, the amount of time Apple invests in everything, but especially packaging is exactly that. Um, this next piece, you know, is about Apple's singular obsession, which is the customer experience. If there's one focus at Apple that transcends all others, it's the customer experience. The goal is to give the customer a consistently great experience throughout their entire relationship with Apple. From TV ad and website to shopping to unboxing to everyday use and repair and support, Apple aims to co consistently deliver the same values and speak in the same tone. Th these were more just little ideas. There's a chapter called Think War that I didn't love, but there's a couple, two ideas, really just two sentences that I thought stood out. It must become your nature to never relent. It must become your nature to never relent. And every plan and every new idea needs to break through a layer of resistance. And, you know, the second one is important in the context of, again, we've said that simplicity is hard to achieve. It's not easy to achieve. It requires more work to get to something that's simple. And, you know, I think this quote, every new plan or every new idea needs to break through a layer of resistance. That's true, but it's also true that it needs to break through a layer of resistance to get to a simple outcome. Uh, it's, I think it's just important to keep in mind. Again, simple is not easy. Simple is incredibly difficult, but simple is important because it's universally appealing. And I think, you know, my thought on simplicity, directionally speaking, is that it's only becoming more and more and more valuable as we live in a world that, generally speaking, is filled with chaos and complexity. Okay, I, we're coming up on the last two chapters. One of them is about thinking different. Um, and there's a couple of things I thought were really interesting. In an interview, Steve Jobs once said, sometimes when you innovate, you make mistakes. It's best to admit them quickly and get on with improving your other innovations. Steve Jobs was a firm believer in the concept of the brand bank. He believed that a company's brand works like a bank account. When the company does good things, uh, such as launch a hit product or a great campaign, it makes deposits in the brand bank. When a company experiences setbacks, like an embarrassing mouse or an overpriced computer, it's making a withdrawal. When there's a healthy balance in the brand bank, customers are willing to ride out the tough times. With a low balance, they might be tempted to cut and run. Having a high balance in the brand bank makes all the difference. And that's it. Those are, um, you know, we went through most of, or at least most of the, you know, the, the best ideas uh, from the 10 uh, different chapters. These are 10 principles of simplicity in the book, Insanely Simple. And where I wanted to try to end things was um, basically with a little bit of a synopsis. And um, it's all around this idea of like, okay, if this book is about simplicity, if what we've been talking about, you know, hopefully you are as bought in as I am, that simplicity is important. It's rare, it's special, and it's some, It's a superpower if you can learn how to harness it. You know, I think the book is really part trying to make that case and, and underscore all of the reasons why simplicity is important. And the book is also tactically, uh, you know, through a lot of it, through, through a bunch of uh, examples, most of which I hope resonate with you. They resonate deeply with me in the, in the work that I've done. Um, and I hope that they resonate with you. And so it's half tactics, it's half story. You know, so I want to try to bring all that together with a little synopsis. And so this is, uh, we're going to do a quick recap of all the chapters, and this is about how to harness the power of simplicity. So again, principle number one was think brutal. 
No need to be mean about it, just brutally honest and avoid the partial paths, or sorry, avoid the partial truths while you're at it. Ask those you interact with to do the same. People will be more focused, more positive, and more productive when they don't have to guess what you're thinking. Positive or negative, make honesty the basis of all interactions. You'll avoid wasting valuable time and energy later. Think brutal. Principle number two, think small. Swear allegiance to the concept of small groups of smart people. Remember it well when new project groups are formed. This is a key component of simplicity, and you must become its champion. Small groups of smart people deliver better results, higher efficiency, and improved morale. Also, look suspiciously at any project plan that doesn't include the regular participation of the final decision maker. It's critical. Having the decision maker appear at the end of the process to say yay or nay is a recipe for frustration and mediocrity. Number three, think minimal. Be mindful of the fact that every time you attempt to communicate more than one thing, you're splintering the attention of those you're talking to. Whether they're customers or colleagues, if it's necessary to deliver multiple messages, find a common theme that unites them all and push hard on that idea. You want people to remember what you say, and the more you cram into your communication, the more difficult you make it for them. Remember that a sea of choices is no choice at all. The more you can uh, minimize your proposition, the more attractive it will be. Principle number four, think motion. The perfect project timeline is only slightly less elusive than the Holy Grail. It takes some effort to figure it out, but once you do, you'll have created a template that promotes success. You may not be the person tasked with creating timelines, but you can try to influence those who are. This is the kind of thing that most people just accept, but they shouldn't. The right timing is as important as the right people. The right timing is as important as the right people. Again, what did we talk about earlier? About finding that fulcrum between not enough time, which means you're going to ship something that's not remarkable, and too much time, which means you get into overthinking territory and you're likely to start uh, making corrosive decisions instead of value additive decisions. Always be wary of the quote unquote comfortable timeline. It's just a fact of life that a degree of pressure keeps things moving ahead with purpose. With too much time in the schedule, you're just inviting more opinions and more opportunities to have your ideas nibbled to death. Keep things in motion at all times. Number five, think iconic. Even if you're not in the marketing biz, it will serve you well to crystallize your thinking by leveraging an image that can symbolize your idea or the spirit of it. And if you are in the marketing business, you're simply required by law to think this way. Whatever presentations you make, whatever products you sell, whomever you're trying to convince, never forget the power of an image to galvanize your audience. Note that there's a big difference between finding a great image and decorating a PowerPoint presentation. There's too much decorating in the world already, and for the most part, it's meaningless. Find a conceptual image that actually captures the essence of your idea. Be simple and be strong. The same principle applies whether you're talking to colleagues or the public. Over time, a conceptual image um, gives people an easy way to identify your company, your idea, or your product. Memorable images often communicate more effectively than words, which is why those who value simplicity tend to rely on them. Think Brazel. This is an area where just about every business needs more work. Words are powerful, but words are, uh, sorry, but words are powerful, but more words are not more powerful. They're often just confusing. Understand that in your company's internal business and in communications with your customers, dissertations don't necessarily prove smarts. In fact, they tend to drive people away. Though many writers never seem to grasp the point, using intelligent words does not necessarily make you appear smarter. The best way to make yourself or your company look smart is to express an idea simply and with perfect clarity. No matter who your audience is, it's more effective to communicate as people do naturally, in simple sentences, using simple words. Simplicity is its own form of cleverness, saying a great deal by saying little. Apple's website is a primer for intelligence and communications. There's a cleverness in writing that runs throughout, but much of the feeling of Apple's quote-unquote smarts comes from its brevity and its straightforwardness. In a world where too many people are trying too hard, simplicity can be extremely refreshing. The same can be said for product naming. Simple and natural names stick with people while jargon and model numbers do not. If you wish people to form a relationship with your product, it needs a name people can naturally associate with. Product naming in is one area in which simplicity pays immediate returns. Think casual. Do what Steve Jobs did. Shun the trappings of big business. Operating like a smaller, less hierarchical company makes everyone more productive. 
and makes it more likely that you'll become a bigger business. Choreographed meetings and formalized presentations may transfer information of person to person, but they neither inspire nor bring, it nor bring a team closer together. Embrace the fact that you'll get more accomplished when you converse with people rather than present to them. You'll still have plenty of opportunities to dress up and do things the old-fashioned way, but internally and on a day-to-day -day basis with your clients, deformalize. Many great creative ideas are actually born in these types of briefings when keywords or phrases emerge in conversation. Some of the agency's most compelling words for Apple were generated this way. If you want to reap the benefits of simplicity, think big, but don't act that way. As Steve Jobs proves, uh, proved one of the most effective ways to become a big business is to maintain the culture of a small business. It's so well said. And again, Steve Jobs is not the only uh, person to advocate for this. Jeff Bezos. Uh, there's a very long line of entrepreneurs, all of which have been enormously successful, which I think have this same idea. One of the most effective ways to become a big business is to maintain the culture of a small business. Think human. Unless you're in the business of sterilizing things, business is not a place to be sterile. Have the boldness to look beyond numbers and spreadsheets and allow your heart to have a say in the matter. Bear in mind that the intangibles are every bit as real as the metrics. Oftentimes, even more important, the simplest way and most effective way to communicate with human beings is to speak with a human voice. It may not necessarily, uh, it may be necessary in your business to market to specific target groups, but bear in mind that every target is a human being and human beings respond to simplicity. Think skeptic. Expect the first reaction of others to be negative. The forces of complexity will inevitably tell you that something can't be done even if the truth is that your request simply requires extra effort. Okay, give me one second. I'm going to try to find, um, missing one sheet here. You'll probably achieve better results if you believe more in the talent of people to work miracles than in those who are quick to provide negative answers. Don't allow the discouragement of others to force compromise upon your ideas. Push. If you can't get satisfaction with one person or vendor, move to another. If there was one area in which Steve Jobs had a well-deserved reputation for being impossible, this was it. He was relentless about executing ideas and demanding that people perform. Take pride in your independence and objectivity too. See facts and opinions in context. Definitely consider the expertise of those who provide counsel but evaluate those opinions against things that may be beyond the expert's vision like uh, your long-term goals. Steve Jobs knew that the short-term cost, even if it's large, is often outweighed by the future benefit. Real leaders have the ability to grasp the context and decide accordingly. Simplicity isn't afraid to act on common sense, even if it runs counter to an expert's opinion. And last is principle number 10, think war. Extreme times call for extreme measures. When your ideas are facing life or death, that's an extreme time. Like a soldier in battle, you can't afford to suffer even a single hit, so make sure you hit first. Pull out all the stops. Remember, when your idea's life is on the line, the last thing you want is a fair fight. Use every weapon available. If possible, grab the unfair advantage. And never forget what might well be your single most effective weapon, the passion you feel for your idea. Okay, that's a quick synopsis and recap of the 10 principles. Again, this has been an epic two-part, went much longer than I thought it would, breakdown of Insanely Simple, The Obsession That Drives Apple's Success by Ken Seagal. I highly encourage you to read the book. You know, my uh, book uh, obviously is uh, dog-eared. I've got a bunch of uh, stickies on different pages. It's also just prolifically marked up, like all of my books are. Um, this is a great one. It's a keeper. And again, this is part of a series of breakdowns we're doing on Steve Jobs. Um, we've got I, Steve. We have Make Something Wonderful. We have Becoming Steve Jobs. We have Insanely Simple. I'm also going to do a handful of uh, interviews, including a breakdown of the lost interview from 1995 with Steve Jobs, which is a remarkable interview that he did that actually was lost for a period of time. They, they couldn't figure out where the footage was, and it was rediscovered. You can now find it online. If you're interested, Google the lost interview. Um, I will be doing a breakdown of that soon as a short form episode. Thank you so much for listening. Again, this was episode 174. I highly encourage you to go browse through all of our notes, highlights, and more at outlieracademy.com slash insanely simple. Thank you so much for listening.